All right, thanks for the introduction, Brad. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Pat Kenyon, and Habitat Creation with me started with hounding James Smith at TreeNet a few years ago. He was a zoologist walking around and talking about habitat in trees. And um, for the whole day we were thinking, geez, I'm pretty confident we can do a lot of the stuff he's talking about with chainsaws. And that's where a fair bit of it stemmed from. Um, after talking to James, we went home, pulled out our chainsaws, had a crack at it, and thought, well, that looks like it'll work, let's have a go at it. And we put some hollows in some trees. Um, I'm not sure how, how long after that it was that we got back in contact with James and I'd say it was nearly 12 months at the next tree net and said, look James, this is what we've done. And James goes, that looks great but it probably won't really work, you need a bit of science behind it. And through what you've heard of James today is the science behind creating the habitat hollows that work. Um, the, probably the best thing that I can say out of doing it is, is, number one, it's quick, it's easy, it's simple, and if you build it, they will come. I've, not every single hollow that I've put in um, has had, had something living in it, but I'd say about 90% of them have had something move in. James mentioned it was five or six days after you put up a nesting box that you had um, rosellas move in it. We've done a lot around Darabin, a lot around the La Trobe University and had very similar results if it's been around the time birds are, birds are nesting. Um, so pretty well, if we put them in in the August, September period, we've had nearly instant success. Uh, at a demonstration we did a few years ago at TreeNet, basically in the morning I went out and pruned a couple of um, elms, put some hollows in them so we could walk around with a group and show them the hollows we'd put in that it was the best success I've ever had. A resident Kip Kookaburra for the first group was sitting in the hollow for everyone to take photos of. <laughs> you know, that was within a matter of hours. Um, obviously not nesting in it, but still use, using it and investigating it. My, the main part of my talk today will be basically on just how to do it, and hopefully so that you can all take it back and go, look, we can do it. Generally, I'd say it's for arborists or people that have got a pretty good skill level with chainsaws. Um, so providing you've got skills with chainsaws, it's not too difficult to do. I don't think it covers wet every area, the habitat hollows that we put in. There's only certain areas that you can use them and you can't use them everywhere and in every single tree. Where have all the hollows gone? I left this, um, this photo up mainly because of my grandfather's and James, although he talked about them, but Dad's always said to me about this, where have all the hollows gone? This bird's actually nesting in the old jam tin. Which is pretty spectacular. You know, that if there's nothing else around, they will find something to nest in. It's amazing what, what nature will use. Um, recently, Kilmore, I'm not sure if you've heard of it, that's where I live, but in 2009, it was the start of the Black Saturday fires. And last year in 2014, we had another, the Micklem fires came through Kilmore and caused a, a fair bit of um, destruction, no way near the effects of, um, of the Black Saturday fires. The photograph you're looking at now, this is some of the works that we did after the Black Saturday fires. The council I live in was heavily impacted, um, masses and masses of roadside vegetation was burnt. And it was right when we'd first sort of talked to James about habitat, as to the council came along and said, what are we going to do with all these dead trees leaning over the road? Well, to cut them all down to make the road safe was going to be an absolutely massive task. So the next thing was to do, we suggested, right, what if we turn them into habitat stumps? Um, and they sort of said, oh, that sounds good. I said, it's probably going to cost you about a third the cost. You don't have to chop the whole tree down and you're going to have some habitat value. After talking to James about it and looking at all the little hat stands that we've created, you can have a look at them and go, well really, what is going to live in them, other than a lot of birds perching on them and they're pretty unsightly to look at. And they're going to be, most of them, by the time you've got a habitat hollow that's decayed into it or been bored into it by bugs and beetles and fungi, um, the tree will probably fall over. So the value that you, we're going to get out of creating these so-called habitat stumps by cost saving the councils is probably going to be reasonably limited uh, unless you do any sort of further works to them to speed up that process. 
Most of these, the root systems will rot out and they'll fall over before they're of a great deal of value. Um, with the habitat creation, we started off creating it in only dead trees, as you saw before, and then we've moved through dead trees to live trees that have had to come out for various reasons, whether they be um, faulty or in high use areas with structural issues and rather than cut them down we've gone well, look what if we turn it into a habitat stump, we'll ring bark it, poison it, turn it into a dead tree and, and put some hollows in it. <coughs> Our thinking slowly changed from that going well if you've got a dead tree and you put hollows in it there's no protection around that dead tree or any, any um, other canopy in the dead tree to number one regulate the temperature or protect the babies or whatever animals are in it from predators. So if we deal with live trees creating habitat now, what we've been doing is turning them into a so-called habitat stump, putting habitat hollows in them, and then waiting for epicormic regrowth to come up to provide some protection and some shelter around the entrance, around the whole canopy, and giving it one, two or three years or five years, just watching the epicormics and monitoring them uh, before killing it so that you'll still have some branches and canopy up there to, to give the entrances um, some protection. It's not going to be as good as a live tree at regulating temperature, but it's going to be a lot better off than a dead stark tree uh, that's got no protection at all. Um, with pruning, we've always taken off every single little piece of dead wood. I remember with my um, tree climber training at the tree works, having to go back up an 80 foot tree for Tom Greenwood because I'd missed about a you know, a foot long, 20 mil in diameter piece of dead wood at the top of the tree. That's once it got all the way to the ground. He's like, oh, Pat, you missed a bit. You've got to go back up there and get it. Our, our thoughts on pruning have changed significantly since then. And as arborists, everyone is becoming aware of what is in the trees and um, that we don't have to take off every last single piece of dead wood. And even in the setting spots like this, you can quite comfortably prune off dead limbs or prune them back to a point where they're reasonably sound and still maintain hollows in trees. Uh, it's, it's reasonably easy to do, it's just basically ch changing your mindset to be able to leave a dead stub behind in a tree compared to all the boricultural training that we've had before. I'm not sure James got someone to raise their hands as arborists. Can in, anyone here put their hand up and say they've seen this before? This is one hell of a big issue in what we do as arborists. I've done that before, and I'm not sure how many times. It's basically go into a tree, take the dead wood out of it, you drop a dead branch on the ground because it's a hazard, and there's bats or some other fauna um, living in it. Um, they've even had, I've done it at Melbourne Zoo, where we had someone do an inspection of the trees before we did them, um, before we did the pruning or the removal works on it. We don't have any <coughs> absolutely sound remedies as to, uh, James would probably have a better idea, as to stop um, us causing grief, a lot of grief, to native fauna when we do tree work. And there's definitely some ways to do it, to go in, look at them first, monitor them. James did some reasonably um, interesting work in South Australia, I think it was last year with possums, and catching the possums or, to, or blocking up the ends of the logs with possums in the tree, cutting the log off and then lowering it to the ground and then taking the possums away and relocating them. Um, but with bats and other fauna, sometimes in a borer culture, unless you're aware of it, which I'm certainly a hell of a lot more aware now, it's very hard to go that there are bats in the tree before you chop it down, um, especially in the instance if you are taking a whole tree down rather than just a branch. This is one that uh, my father continuously goes on about, the payback system. And it starts off with, if you're a big old tree in a nutrient deficient soil, why wouldn't you have hollows? Why wouldn't you encourage other animals to live in your canopy and put nutrient deposits around it each time they move in and out? And I think it's part of an ecosystem we don't understand. And in all the big old red gums, how many animals live in these big old red gums, they're just one example of a species, but how many animals live in there and deposit nutrients at the base of that tree? We don't understand how important it is and how vital it is to keep those trees alive. Uh, the gill tree that was up 
before I just went and looked at it early last week and I was amazed and an arborist from uh, the local council up there asked me to come and have a look at it and I was amazed at how uh, big this tree was. The trunk on it's probably for myself to sorry, Julia um, in diameter so it's you know, on four metres through. It's absolutely huge. And as soon as I saw the photo that was up here of it before, I've gone, well, geez, when I saw it, it looks about 50% of that. At least nearly 50% of the canopy's been blown off the windstorm. But one thing that's amazing with it is, is the number of hollows and the number of birds and the number of animals that are using this one giant red gum. And the nutrients that come out of those animals have got to be beneficial to the tree um, to keeping it alive. That's with the nutrients. The other thing that we don't think about is, is how many of these birds actually attack some of the leaf-eating insects that give the tree a really hard time. Um, we know the birds help control them. We've just got no research or data to say that you know, this sort of bird does this, and if less the red gum's got that bird around, it's not going to survive. But um, in the new urban environment where we've got all these um, subdivisions going on and you tend to drive along and you see a sea of houses, a little spot park and another little spot park and they've created a park so that the developer couldn't take the, the big tree down. I'm not sure of the longevity and how long these big trees that are great habitat trees are going to survive. They might be all good for five or ten years which is um, only a snapshot in their lifetime like these are four and five hundred year old trees. And we're suddenly changing the whole enviro environment around them as, at, as arborists and going, well, look, we've got our tree protection zone. That's how far out you have to build from it. Let's mulch it and do all the other bits and pieces and the tree will be fine. I'd really like to have a bit of a snapshot in time and see if the tree is still there in 50 years. And I'd also like to see if it's going to be there in another 100 or 150 years. And I'd say the chances of it still being there are going to be pretty slim. Um, if you've got an isolated tree, sticking out like that, they seem to all automatically become um, possum magnets. And when you've got you know, all these houses getting built, the possums have got to go somewhere and they've got to feed on something. And suddenly um, you know, they tend to graze these red gums and graze them and graze them. Um, and there's plenty of red gums I've seen die just because of, could be called possum overgrazing or it could be called people overpopulating and the possums really can't get from one tree to another anymore. They're just isolated in their single single locations. Um, we'll flick through that one. We've had James and everyone else has talked lots and lots about the um, about how trees provide habitat and how trees provide hollows for, for animals. Um, Two years ago at TreeNet when we did a presentation we all discussed hollows and how much habitat trees actually provide. One thing that no one's mentioned today is, is how much habitat do trees provide for humans. <coughs> I know for sure that if it's a hot day everyone stands in the shade. That's the first thing they do. If it's raining you normally stand underneath the tree to get out of the worst of the weather. Um, there are only a couple of small physical things that trees provide as habitat for us. So that they're not just habitat for birds and other fauna, but humans use them more and more and more. And shade's probably one of the most beneficial things that we get out of them, other than the obvious you know, oxygen and those sorts of things. Um, this tree here is possibly one of the first habitat trees I created and that was in, I'm not exactly sure, but around 2003-2005 for Hume City Council. We created it as a habitat tree for possibly two reasons. In those days I only had a ute and tandem trailer so when Hume sent me out to remove it was like how the hell are we going to get all that chopped down and gotten rid of? Um, <coughs> That was honestly some of the thinking, like, you know, it's a huge tree, how are we going to get rid of it? And it was full of hollows. Since then, it's probably a great example of a habitat tree that works because it was full of hollows and there's still birds nesting in it, but it's probably one of the worst examples of a habitat tree I've ever created. It's an old dead Lacoxlin. When it falls over and when the root system rots out, it's not only going to fall over this person's driveway, but it's going to get the corner of the house over there. Um, since creating that, 
just about any other habitat tree we've created, we've sort of put some guidelines on it to say, if you're going to create one, they're not going to be here forever. They might be here for 20 to 50 years, but at some stage they are going to fall over. You need to create them in a location that where they're going to fall over, they're not going to impact on anyone. Uh, unless you've got the ability to come back and consistently monitor and maintain that tree. This one, I don't have any ability to, to maintain at all. Um, it's a council tree. They know it exists and that's about as much as they know about it. There's, there's no maintenance program in place for it. Um, this one's a little bit different. This is in a private garden and we can go back and look at it and basically the rapport I've got with the private client, we can do whatever we like to it, whether we keep reducing it, put more hollows in it and maintain it. Um, the only thing I wasn't able to sell to the client was to get rid of their green lawn underneath and, uh, and mulch it and underplant it. So they wanted to keep, keep their green lawn. Creating the habitat hollows is um, relatively simple. You can knock the canopy off to a level where you think it's, um, or you can look at it and go, well, if any of this canopy falls over now, it's not gonna land on, on the path, the road, or a building. Uh, it's a pretty simple procedure in creating a hollow. And the great thing is, is that once it's done, it does work um, consistently with the hollows we've put in. I haven't done any super specific monitoring other than go back and visit the ones that we've put in from time to time. I think I'd be probably close to 200 to 250 hollows that are put in various locations now. Um, but they do work. And I'd say 90% of that is thanks to James's input of have your orientation correct and the different sizes to aim it at this different species. Another really important thing with putting or looking at habitat stumps is, is that if you've got an isolated tree like the one I showed you before, you're going to get a certain number of animals move into it. But if you can mulch underneath it, create understory planting as well, you're creating a lot more protection and a lot more, eventually the smaller trees here will come up and shade that old habitat stump and they'll help to basically get you a much more consistent temperature so on those hot days you're not going to have animals cooked inside them. And the only thing that's ironic about this photo is, this is at RMIT in Bandura, uh, this tree <coughs> died from possums overgrazing it. So again, it's a slightly was a used to be a slightly isolated red gum out in a lawn area. The possums got into it. Nothing was done, and the uh, the poor old red gum died. Um, again, a few of the points that James has gone over with the entrance size hole. It's vital with that, as in creating it. How we can create it is with drills which we've got a good little example of here that's brand new, I should take it home with me. <laughs> um, one thing I've found with these two straight drills is that uh, unless you've got wrists made of steel, they're pretty good at twisting them off, doing some of the stuff that we do. So, where'd Brad go? Is he gone home yet? Yeah. That, that's good. Um, so we've gone away, <laughs> gone, gone away from using the super powerful two stroke drill to more cordless drills and they don't quite seem to have the torque or the power to actually twist your hands off because we're drilling sort of bigger, bigger sized holes. Uh, but yeah, they're great, but they keep going, but I was, just, was hoping Brad had gone. Um, we'll keep the escape ladder is probably one thing I wanted to um, touch on for a second with the habitat hollows. With our chainsaws, the first couple that we bought out I spent a lot of time and effort with the chainsaw and um, really touched up my chainsaw skills to get all my cuts to meet absolutely perfectly. Then we got a chisel inside the hollow and cleaned it out entirely. We had James come along and guess what are you doing that for? Why don't you just leave it all rough? It gives the bird actually somewhere to get out of the hollow. If it's smooth, they can't get out and they'll probably end up dying in there. And I'm like, well, geez, that just made our job about 10 times easier. Why didn't you tell us that before? So, um, just the little bit of input that we've had on and off from James has been astounding as to um, how much you can learn. Every time I meet him and talk to him, um, yeah, I, I get a great deal out of him. The orientation, you've seen, seen this previously, I, I wanted to leave it in, but James has gone and said about 
where to put them. As soon as you get up a tree and you're either in a tower or you're on a set of spurs trying to chainsaw, um, you go, all right, where's the orientation going to be? If the tree's leaning on that angle and you've got to try and stand on the wrong three quarters of the side of the angle on a pair of spurs, it's nearly impossible. So to put hollows in, generally you can probably, if it's not a vertical trunk, you can probably only do it out of a tower. Um, if it's a horizontal trunk, you cannot do it out of a rope and harness. It's just physically impossible. Um, I'd like to be proven wrong, but you, you can't cut around your feet and not cut them off with a chainsaw. So you, you need a tower. So that's one of the main limiting factors. If it's in a vertical trunk, you can quite comfortably stand on your spurs, get your orientation correct, um, and, and put a vertical hollow in. But on anything that's on an angle or on a horizontal, with just the way we're made up and climb trees, we can't stand out from a horizontal branch and do bore cuts safely. Um, so climbing-wise, we're limited to only putting them in vertical trunks. Um, I made Ed mention in the car on the way down here with James, I was recently up at Sydney, and there's another lady up there, Sophie Golding, before we went up there, she made up a, a chart similar to this of the local animals and the sizes and the dimensions <coughs> of hollows to create. Um, the biggest difference was with Sophie's was that she hadn't rounded any of these figures here. With what we do with the chainsaw, if you're talking about something that's 130 mil wide, it's probably going to be between 100 and 150 mil wide. We're not that good um, as builders with a chainsaw to do exact cuts. And when James put this together, he kept in mind that we were using chainsaws to do this. So if you're talking about a 210 mil floor plate in the bottom of your nesting box, we're probably going to be 200 to 250 mil if we cut it out with a chainsaw. And I don't think you can go quite that accurate with a chainsaw. So generally, if you're close to that with the chainsaw, I think you're going very well. If you try and go too fine with the chainsaw, you'll find you'll end up either hurting yourself or completely <coughs> destroying the box by overcutting and chopping it all off and you've got to start again. Um, these have been run over before and I actually think we might have a different thing up, but anyway. Um, discouraging the feral predators, Every, we've gone through a fair bit of that. The thing to go over more than anything is the complementary planting. Um, time and time again after bushfires and all the habitat stumps that have been created in um, in our region, Murray and Dindi, after the 09 fires. It's great to go back now and look at those. There's in the first photo that came up, you can see the regen that is coming up underneath these habitat stumps that are there that um, give them plenty of protection rather than having a single trunk standing out by itself that's out in the middle of nowhere. Um, has anyone seen any of the hollows that we've created with the chainsaw? There's only about four or five people. So the hollows we create are basically done with a system of chainsaw cuts. We take a face plate off, so this section is removed. This cut up here, if it's on a downward sloping angle, will mean that when you get rain on it, it won't actually run back into the hollow. Um, and the same again with the bottom cut. If that's on an upward sloping angle, it means you'll have some drainage in the hollow. It's pretty quick, uh, but it's very important information. Once you've done your, your couple of first couple of cuts, we basically go through and do a series of bore cuts. It's in here. These sections are broken out and because of the way the tree and the wood grows, they um, generally um, break out quite easily and quite quickly. Once you've worked out the size of the cavity that you can create, um, there's a couple of options. You can bore, depending on the orientation, you can either bore out the side, either side, or the back of the, 
back of the hollow so that you've got your entrance hole. And depending on the size of the hollow that you've made will depend on the size of the entrance hole. A few of the limiting factors are that if you want to make a hollow that's 200 mils by 500 mils long, you probably need a minimum tree diameter of 350 to 400 mils in diameter. So you need some pretty big timber to work with if you're going to make bigger hollows. But if you're taking out a big tree, it gives you plenty of opportunities to go, well, this is a nice straight grading piece of timber, um, I'll be able to put a hollow there. Live trees tend to be a hell of a lot easier to work with. Um, so if you've taken out a live tree, it's a lot better, you're a lot better off to cut your hollow, put your hollow in, and then um, let the tree die uh, after it. You can obviously see the chainsaw cuts for the escape ladder. Uh, it's pretty easy to leave them behind. It's a lot more work to go through and take them all out. And then you screw this panel back on, which is your face plate. Normally it takes about an hour from leaving the ground to go up by the time you go up the tree, put a hollow in and come back down to the ground. Um, and that's pretty similar whether you're in a tower or whether you're on a set of spurs. Uh, just on this note here, on these sugar gums that I've gone back to numerous times and had a look at, these ones here we've actually let the epicormics regrow over the last couple of years. And what I've found is, is that where we've screwed the faceplate on is that the sugar gums actually putting on wound wood and growing back over the faceplate. So it means long term it'll become fully enclosed and won't even require screws to, uh, to keep it on. The problem is, is that you can't afford to let the tree grow for too long and get big epicormics growing out the side here because the whole structure will fail eventually. Uh, but it's pretty astounding to see that this has grown back around the old bit of faceplate. Um, that helps with the tree growing because quite often when you take, oh, sorry, take this section off, you'll find that if it's on live timber, it shrinks quite considerably. Um, and you can end up with a gap between your face plate and the actual box. And on the trees where we've had a fair bit of movement and we've had daylight coming through this section because the face plate has shrunk considerably, they tend to be the boxes where nothing's moved into. If we've gone back and tightened the screws up to seal off that bit of daylight, whether it's daylight or access for predators, uh, they seem birds seem to have moved back into them or moved into them. So the ones that have shrunk and we've got gaps of daylight all the way through um, haven't been as successful as the ones that have got a really neat fit and haven't shrunk. And that's the finished product. This is just a few photos of babies in, in a couple. This is one in that we've, we've actually made, so a Rosella and a baby. Uh, and it's great to see they actually work. To get a couple of these photos um, in the ones with the bigger entrances, I found it was just about as easy to uh, get your mobile phone, stick it in and take a photo as the best way to, way to get one. Then a mechanic put me onto a, uh, an inspection camera. Uh, great little device. You can get a really expensive snap on one for three to five hundred dollars. You can buy a thirty dollar LD one that does a pretty similar job. It's just a, a portable camera um, with a tell us or a long um, bendy wire on it and you can stick it through the hole and basically see what's in there. It's quick and e easy to, to see what's actually in them. This is the different range of entrance holes. Um, you can go as big, as small as you like. It's only limited by the drill. If you need to go bigger than about 100 mil with the drill, you can basically just cut it out with a chainsaw to go 200, 300 or 400 mil. That you're not really limited with your, with the piece of timber as to how big the entrance hole you can cut. You can see these have all been drilled into the face plate. That's how we started doing them. Since then we've started drilling all the entrance holes through the actual piece of timber because we found when you put the, the entrance hole into the face plate, the face plate basically weak, got weakened and could potentially crack in half. Uh, so yeah, now we've been putting entrance holes through, through the pieces of the timber um, and just screwing the face plate back on solid. Um, living trees is probably 
Well, putting hollows in living trees for long term is probably a, a pretty contentious issue. We've got a lot, a lot of arborists here and actually creating a hole in a living tree is creating a weak point and a potential for failure. So it's got a lot of issues as to how to do it, where to do it and, and when is it suitable. Um, a couple of locations where it's suitable we, will be where if epicormics develop they can be monitored or in living trees in large dead stubs. It's quite, quite easy and quite reasonable to do it in large dead stubs um, and you'll speed up the decay process and have a hollow in a tree that instead of waiting one or two hundred years you'll have it in one or two hours worth of work. So this is one in a, um, a red gum branch at the city of Hume. Uh, it's right near a tennis court. We were asked to basically go through, remove the dead wood out of the red gum. It was a perfect example of leaving a red gum stub behind. It was about half a metre long. We cut a hollow in. We used the branch stub as the entrance hole. Uh, so you can see the entrance on the other side and then screwed the plate back on. And unless you're really looking for that hollow, you would not know it exists. Uh, I've asked the Hume boys quite often to go past, have a look, see if anything li is it living in it, because they're uh, up and down there all the time and do you know, maintenance. Well, I'm pretty confident none of them found it yet. <laughs> this is one we did at TreeNet, and it's in a live tree in a live stub. This is where you've got potentially really big problems. It's quite easy and possible to do, but if the epicormics that come off this stub at a later date don't get ma managed, there's potential for sort of failure and we've generated and caused the problem for failure. So it's something to, to seriously consider if it's going to go into live stubs. Uh, monitoring. It's not the um, high point of, of my career monitoring them or, um, or logging all the hollows we've put in. But um, I'm a pretty avid hunter and um, use these things quite regularly for hunting. And I thought, geez, why don't we put some of them up at um, some of our hollows? And I looked into it a bit. Well, the latest model that comes out now takes a SIM card. When it takes a, takes a photo, it sends it straight to your computer and you can see what's um, been in the hollow then and there, uh, nearly real time. Uh, yeah, which is great. So rather than us having to climb back up a tree or take a tower back down to a tree in a hollow, if you set a camera up on it, these ones here last around about six months without an aerial. So you've got to go back to the camera, pull the SD card out and look at the photos. The, uh, the other trail cameras that have got an aerial on them, uh, we seem to be able to get about three months out of a set of batteries and then they die on us. Uh, but it means you've got live, live photos and as many of them as you like. This um, Galar's probably yeah, we've had three or four hundred photos of it come through. It seems to yeah, keep going in and out of the same spot and sitting sit there and sit on. But um, it's, a, it's a great way. It gives you, you know, the time of the day when it's going in and out. And this same hollow is the one where we've had you know, photos of a possum going through at night. One thing we have found though is with the, um, the trail cameras is that the trigger action I was talking to James about this morning is, is that by the time something goes past the motion sensor and activates the camera, if it's relatively quick, you get a photo of nothing. Uh, so there's lots and lots of photos of, of actually nothing quite often with them because something's going past the camera too quick for the motion sensor to, uh, to activate the camera. And it's about the only adjustment on the camera that you can't actually adjust. So we've, we've got to hunt around and find better cameras that have got a, yeah, a quicker action. Um, the live branches is still a worry. I still not lose sleep over it at night, but I, I don't want to come across someone in five years' time where you know, an epicormic branch has failed off because it's grown on a hollow that hasn't been maintained and seriously injured one, injured someone. It's something that, um, as arborists, for the last 30 years, we would never have done, which is, is wound a branch and let epicormics grow back on it. So I think creating ha habitat hollows in dead stubs in live trees, a great idea, uh, but not putting them in live, live branches unless we've got some really good form of maintenance to go back and monitor it, 
or it's out in the middle of the bush where if the tree falls over or the branch falls off in 10 or 15 years time, it's not going to hurt anyone or kill anyone. Uh, with creating the hollows, I've got a pretty inventive old man when we first started he started rim barking branches, he used bits of baler time, we used excavators, we tried all sorts of different methods to come up with either fracturing branch ends um, or get hollows into the trees. And pretty well the simplest system we've come up with is what I've just shown you with is with the chainsaw. It seems to be relatively quick, effective and reasonably safe to do. And the other thing is, is that a wide range of people can do it. Um, because it's basically simple, it's just a number of boring cuts with a chainsaw and a few tech screws. So hopefully at the end of today, a lot of people here will either go home and go, I can do that, or I know there's a tree that um, we can do it too. Um, bat mazes is something that I've done lots and lots of, and every time we do a workshop, I come, someone comes up with another idea for either the bat maze or the highs as to how to do them. The bird boxes that we've been creating have been exceptionally um, successful. The bat mazes, I haven't been back to every single one that I've checked, uh, but I haven't seen anything <coughs> successful with them. But recently in Sydney, a lady up there who was uh, well and truly a bat expert, I can't remember her name, said that with her bat boxes, when they put them up to trees, it normally takes between 18 to 24 months before bats move in. I'm not sure if James wants to kick in on that, but it's, it's not as instant as the birds when you've got bats, bats involved. Um, so yeah, so far we haven't had any, uh, what would you call it, real evidence with the bat boxes. What we're making and creating should be suitable for them. We just haven't, haven't had to move in and use them yet that I know of. It's still a very simple process, similar to what we do with the birds. One thing that um, we've started doing slightly different is, is once you've removed the face plate, you create the grooves, normally no thicker than your thumb. The bats are, are tiny, tiny little animals, so there doesn't need to be a huge cavity for these tiny little bats to move into. They live in colonies sometimes of 10, 15, 20, 30, so hence the maze. As long as they can climb in and they use, the idea of the maze is, is that if it's in really cold on one side, of the tree or they're not in enough um, sunshine, one side or the other will be warmer and they can move from one side to the other. What we've previously done is put our entrance hole down on the bottom. As you can see here, um, one thing I've found is that if you put your entrance hole in the side, it's much easier to screw this piece back on. And this piece, when it's screwed back on, is a lot more stable and tends not to move around as, as much and will be there for a, a, you know, more, a longer time. So it just means you're not sort of wounding the face plate, so to speak, you can screw it from the base and the top, and then you can just bore an entrance hole straight in the side with a chainsaw. Uh, and it doesn't really matter whether your entrance hole's in the bottom, the top, um, it's, it's pretty universal as long as it's got it. The other option is, is you can put one on either side or one in the bottom and one in the top. I don't think there's much data to say that you're better off to have it here or there. Um, reptiles and habitats. As arborists, we continuously deal with um, logs and lots and lots and lots of them. I'm not sure how many trees I've cut down turned into firewood, stacked on the nature strip so it disappears and away it goes. And we've been, I've been doing that for nearly 30 years now. And to get rid of the wood, it's always been, oh, we, either, we used to always stack it on the nature strip. This day and age, we chippers have got bigger and better. And a lot of the time now, it just goes through the chipper. Um, creating habitat and enhancing some of those logs rather than waiting 20, 30, 50 or 100 years for decay to settle into them, again with chainsaws, is very quick, um, simple and easy to do. Again, it's just associated with a few bore cuts, a crowbar. If you get a log like this and there's room to leave it behind, um, if you just put the log on the ground, it is, it's going to be you know, 50 or 100 years until it's a great deal of value to anything living on the ground other than a few worms, not to knock the worms. But 
If you uh, get a chainsaw and put a series of bore cuts into it, and then you simply roll the log back over, uh, you've instantly created homes for lots and lots of small animals and mammals that will use it. And you've opened it up to decay, so over the next 20 or 30 years, it's going to continue to decay a lot quicker than just a single log that's lying on the ground. Uh, this tree's a fair way away from here. I think it's just thinking outside the circle a bit. Darabin City Council gave me a call and we said, we said we've got this great big red gum that's leaning over. The lawnmower man hit his head on it the other day. Um, for the last 20 years he's been mowing the lawn, he's never hit his head on the branch. So it's getting closer and closer to the ground. What are we going to do with it? Um, can we cut it down? And I said, well, what if we lay it over with a couple of excavators and see if it survives? We did that. It worked well until the tree got to about there. I had two 30 ton excavators strapped up to it. And uh, once the tree got to about there, well, it was just way too heavy for the two 30 ton excavators. The tree went boom and both excavators went boom. Um, we wanted to gently lower it over and we broke a few of the roots. The tree didn't survive. But what came of it was they fenced around it, underplanted, and there's probably about 100 little red gums starting to come up, which is the next generation. And I thought it might be a bit of an eyesore, and I had um, plenty of comments, um, none bad over the last yeah, four or five years that it's been there. So I think in the urban environment, any big tree that we deal with, and we tend to cut down lots of them because they always tend to be, the, the big trees tend to be the ones that have got hollows in them, got big faults in them, and as arborists you go, well, you, know, you can't really keep that tree there. But such massive pieces of timber in the urban environment need to be reused, recycled, not turned into wood chips and sawdust and firewood. Uh, so if you can keep them, in another 30 years someone can come along and uh, turn it into wood chips and sawdust and firewood when it's of no longer value and it's you know, rotted away to just about nothing. But to, to continuously yeah, chip everything and, and cut it into firewood I don't think is the way forward. Yep. Um, I'll be very, very brief on aquatic habitat. It's not something I've had much to do with, other than um, we've created some and it's worked. But I think, again, with those big logs, you may as why not recycle them, reuse them, put them back into the water if you can. Um, this photo is up in Queensland where Simon Mulaney did some works. And this is from one down on the Yarra where we put some logs in the ground. That's obviously the before, the after. And if you build it, like there's, I'm not sure what sort of bird, but the, uh, that nesting box is absolutely stuffed full of reeds and grass and something's using it. Um, so it's great. So if you build it, they will come. The only thing to take into consideration, I heard about um, what the Sydney siders recently did was put a heap of logs into a river um, only a couple of months ago. They didn't really take into account that the river was tidal and that logs float. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that in mind if you put um, trees into water that they do float and they will move with the water. Any questions? <coughs> Yeah, yep. uh, I was just going to ask, what's the, um, the is there a uh, calculation or a method for the amount of um, uh, timber you remove from the hollow, hollows? Is it two thirds and leave one third of external timber? Timber, not really. Other than you judge on the, if I can flip right back to the to James's. So the size of the hollow that you're making yeah. is pretty well limited by the size of the timber and you've got to leave enough wood and normally with a chainsaw because we're not so precise in cutting you probably need to leave yourself between 30 and 50 mil all the way around um, otherwise you'll find you'll put little daylight holes in your nesting box with the chainsaw so you, you've got to leave yourself enough timber behind. What about a square cut? for your exit, exit and entry. Does it have to be a circular cut? No, we've no. only gone to a circular cut with the drills because it's 
simple and easy. Yep. Um, as soon as we've gone for bigger sizes than a 100 mil drill P, bit, we've done it with the chainsaw and just bore out a square cut. Yep. Then we actually just round the edges off so it doesn't look quite so square. Yep. Um, so far, a lot of councils have taken it on board. We've got quite a few regular um, customers as councils. We've done some in primary schools. Uh, we've done quite a few private people, like private trees. Um, there's a couple of reasons for doing the private ones, is that if you ask the resident, if they've got a nesting box there already and they've got a dead tree they'd like taken out, you can go, look, what if we leave it as a habitat stump? We'll put a couple of you know, habitat hollows in there. The residents are normally absolutely stoked about the idea. With councils, they're normally um, quite happy to take it on board, especially when you go, look, it's going to cost you three grand to take this tree down, take it away and grind the stump. It's going to cost you 1800 bucks for us to chop the tops off, put two or three hollows in and leave the stump behind. You've got to come back and do some understory planting. Um, so it's a pretty good selling point if you've got the right tree in the right location. Over on the end here, yeah, I was just wondering, have you had uh, any experience in doing multiple different boxes in the same length of wood with different size holes? And if you have, have multiple animals and mammals moved in? Um, have you had, uh, we've tried to, through what James has told us, is that if you have, depending on what species you're trying to get in, some are pretty territorial. So if you've got something like Rosella, <coughs> they'll tend not to let another another pair of rosellas nest relatively close to them, they'll, otherwise they'll just fight all day. Um, whereas if you have lorikeets and you put four or five lorikeets um, nest hollows in, in a tree, you'll find that most of those will be taken up by lorikeets, they tend not to fight and be quite as bossy as the rosellas. Does that answer that? Yeah. Good one up. Um, Grant mentioned this morning about accelerating decay, accelerating natural decay. Have you done any experiments with um, isolated trees? Haven't done anything with that. It would be um, really interesting to do whether you could inoculate trees to, uh, to uh, yeah, make them decay a lot quicker. I know over in the States the Americans do it in their um, dug fir forests. They go through and kill trees and, in, and inoculate them with decay basically because you've got this uniform forest of all live trees and no dead trees. And a lot of the animals over there that use the trees aren't like nesting dead trees. No. Oh, when are you going to get together with, and, uh, and come up with the Australian standard? As <laughs> <laughs> soon as I find the time. Oh, and, and we're more than happy for you to head up that subcommittee, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> up the back here, one yeah, last question. How much wood are you leaving a buffer all over you? Normally two to three hundred mils. Yeah. Um, you don't want to leave too much, otherwise it can work as a cantilever and actually buck all the box or the hollow. So yeah, normally two to three hundred mils. Um, you don't want to go too thin either, otherwise as the trunk dries out it'll crack and you'll get water coming straight in the top. Okay, Mr Mitchell, make you the last. The, um, if you were to have a pin <coughs> on the grave, the risk of that, is the risk just from the failure of it from the grave five ten years down the track or is it also a risk? to the hollow that you've created from the failures of the epicornic growth? So both, so you've got risk of epicornic failure, but you've got risk of the epicornics <coughs> growing on the weakened branch structure that you've created, so making both of them fail. So you wouldn't want you know, half a hollow to fall out of a tree because it's got an epicornic <coughs> attached to it and land on top of someone's head. So yeah, it's definitely got big issues letting live or putting hollows in, in live pieces of timber without coming back and, and killing them.